Death by Half-Life, an all-too-common tale of many a PC game in 1998. The game which introduced our favorite crowbar-wielding physicist saw a level of success so great that there was simply no opening in the market for another FPS. The greatest casualty of Half-Life's overwhelming popularity is, without a doubt, Sin. So much so that I had to open this video talking about it because it's impossible to discuss this game in any capacity without mentioning the shellacking Half-Life gave it. Released less than two weeks before Gordon Freeman's Wild Ride, Sin's 10-day lead barely mattered as the game was plagued with bugs and excessive load times. By the time developer Ritual Entertainment was able to iron out these problems, the damage had already been done. They were forced to watch as Valve took their first steps on the road to controlling PC gaming as we know it. Crazy how releasing a busted game actually hurts sales once upon a time, isn't it? Who published this again? We've got to have money. Well, that explains a lot. That's not to say Sin was a total failure. Its sales were strong enough to garner an expansion pack, Wages of Sin, as well as a crappy OVA. Your little rendezvous with the mob, the fact that you murdered my brother, your sins will catch up with you, Blade. Ah, ah, there it is! There it is! And a failed attempt to revive the series as an episodic game. And in the 25 years since, dear god, it's been 25 years, Sin has gained a respectable enough cult following. That cult status earned it a re-release from Night Dive Studios, a company I'm probably going to wind up talking about a lot in my videos. Thank you, you blessed souls for Power Slave Exhumed. That re-release, titled Sin Gold, is what I played for this video. This used to be a real pain in the ass to get running on newer versions of Windows and widescreen monitors, so it's much appreciated to have a copy of Sin that I don't need to consult PC Gaming Wiki in order to get it working. Set in the distant future of 2037, anyone else find it weird that we're actually closer to that date than Sin's original release date? I swear it was just yesterday that I was a hormonal teen looking up footage of a certain easter egg. Oh, we definitely gotta get you out of that stable more. Anyways, in the grim darkness of 2037, there are only mega corporations. The city of Freeport in particular has traded in public law enforcement for private security firms. Chief among them is the group Hardcore, the employer of our hero, Colonel John Blade. Now, most cyberpunk stories of this nature would have something to say about a private company acting as judge, jury, and executioner on the streets, but this is a late 90s FPS. Get those perfectly valid ethics concerns out of here. We're here to shoot shit, blow up the shit we can't shoot, and occasionally ogle low-poly boobies. For a game made in the Quake 2 engine, Sin has a lot more in common with Duke Nukem than any id software game. Lowbrow humor, a mouthy protagonist, Large levels filled with plenty of interactivity that exists solely to immerse the player in the world rather than provide any tangible game benefit. You're introduced to this almost immediately as, after a brief turret section, the very first room you're dropped into as a fully interactive ATM. Later on, if you do some snooping in the bank's security terminal, you can find account passwords and PIN numbers. Most of these are just references you can't do anything with, but you can actually wire all the money from the account of the main villain, Alexis Sinclair, into Blade's account. From what I can tell, there's no benefit to doing so. It's just there for you to do if you want to amuse yourself. And I'd say it's a spoiler that Alexis is the big bad if her name wasn't Sinclair and she wasn't the CEO of Sintech in a game called Sin. A game where she takes up even more advertising space than Blade himself. It's honestly weird they didn't make her the main character. I guess they were going for a villain-focused franchise? The bank level is also your introduction to the feel of shooting in Sin, and honestly, it feels really good. The controls are responsive, and I didn't have to fiddle with mouse sensitivity before I could aim properly. Considering this is the Quake 2 engine we're talking about, that seems like a no-brainer. However, this engine also powered duds like Daikatana and Kingpin. Ugh, Kingpin. I must feel bad for Daikatana sharing a label with that game. Now keep your fucking ass out of poison, you fuck. At least Daikatana has a fan patch that makes it, well, not a good game, but one I didn't hate myself for playing. Back to Sin. You'll get a pistol, shotgun, and machine gun to play with for starters. The pistol is incredibly useful early on as headshots are paramount, though it does get outpaced by the MG once you start getting more ammo. I can at least say I liked using this pistol, a rare statement for me regarding an FPS from this time. The shotgun is a video game shotgun. Not particularly great, and I don't care for its widespread. I double check Quake 2's and it doesn't seem to have the same issue. Though that could be down to locational damage being a thing in Sin, but not in Quake 2. Now we come to the love of my life. The machine gun. My aiming is total garbage on a good day, so anytime I can spray and pray is a good time. Sin's machine gun, though. Oh, baby, how I love this gun. 
a huge clip, accurate even at stupid far distances, barely any recoil and more ammo than I could ever need for two-thirds of the campaign. Around a corner and unload a few bursts into the nearest skull. Never stops being satisfying. Especially when they fall ass over tea kettle like that. Later on, your arsenal expands to include a belt-fed heavy machine gun that doubles as a grenade launcher, spider mines which you can manually detonate, a good old-fashioned missile launcher, an underpowered plasma cannon I never found much use for, a harpoon gun for underwater sections, though your other guns work fine too, and a sniper rifle that takes an eternity to equip, but is powerful enough to jib weaker enemies with a single shot. You're going to want to conserve ammo for this one for the late game sections filled to the brim with snipers who will... that. They'll do that to you. Okay, I think I got them all in. Son of a bitch! Where the hell was that one? Oh, hidden by the tree. That's real fair. As if the endless heavy machine gun toting enemies and mutants who hit like a truck and bum rush you the second they see you weren't bad enough. Is it too much to ask for the snipers to occasionally miss me? Yeah, yeah, get good and all that. I've got my own answer to that one. Quick saves. Roll the death montage. Finally, I made it. How many deaths was that? Huh. I was honestly expecting more. Good on you, me. Maybe in another decade or two, I'll finally be able to play games like this on hard. Eh, probably not. I can't exactly call this spike in difficulty a huge problem when it comes so late in the game. I do hate the late game's tendency to spawn enemies in behind you after you make progress. Maybe it's the Doom fanboy in me, but I prefer it when the game at least tries to pretend that these enemies weren't just waiting in hammer space for me to go do the thing. I don't mind a challenge so long as the game is playing by clear rules. Moments like this feel more like Sin has to cheat in order to get a kill. Which isn't true at all. I'm a bumbling moron perfectly capable of getting myself killed without AI assistance, thank you very much. Oh, I almost forgot about Sin's version of the BFG, the Quantum Destabilizer. Charge it up and watch it rip enemies to shreds. Just don't charge it too much or you'll end up like me. So why is Blade doing all this shooty bang bang in the first place? Well, what starts as an attempt to foil a mobster's bank heist quickly spirals into investigating the corporation's Syntech after said mobster is turned into a bloodthirsty mutant. Shocker of all shocks, a company with the name Syntech is evil and have been testing out a new kind of mutagen that their CEO plans to use as part of her plan to conquer the world. Only Blade with the help of his annoying sidekick, JC, has the guts and the firepower to stop this future sufferer of chronic back pain? Seriously, look at those things. Each one is bigger than her head. Better rendered, too. And save the world. In a lot of ways, Sin's story feels like an M-rated take on Saturday morning cartoons like G.I. Joe with an added cyberpunk flair. You play as a gun-toting anti-hero beholden to no clear authority, blasting your way through a horde of identical mooks, and the glitched civilians who won't get out of the damn doorway, come on! Wait, what are you doing, man? Those are friendlies! Oh, shut up, JC. It's not like I could have shot out the window and crawled in... Oh. Well, that scientist made me fear for my life by not posing a threat in any way. So I'll be back from paid suspension in no time. Between that, the gory violence that surprises even Blade himself at times, oh, holy shit. and the buxom designs of every single female NPC, I don't know whether to consider Sin a satire of 90s shooters, or a normal late 90s shooter packed with so much edginess and immaturity that it actually blunders its way into satire. Come to think of it, with all the sex and violence, Sin also shares a lot with stuff you'd find in heavy metal. The magazine, not the music genre. In fact, I'm shocked that Ritual never made anything directly connected to heavy metal. Oh, hang on, hang on. I'm getting a call on this rotary phone that suddenly appeared. Hello? What's that? They did? And it's a tie-in slash follow-up to the film Heavy Metal 2000? The one I vastly preferred to the 80s film? Oh, I shouldn't have said that part out loud? But it's got Michael Ironside and Billy Idol hamming it up! 
Yeah, I guess you do have a point. 80s kids are ruthless like that. Now about this game. You say it's called Fact 2? And I've owned it for several years now. And the viewers are starting to get pissed at this overly long joke that I should have trimmed down? Now you say I'm getting too meta with it, and that simply acknowledging the joke's gone on too long doesn't make it funny? Have you considered that I'm keeping this going just to be a dick at this point? Or that there's been a timestamp in the lower right corner this whole time telling the viewer where to skip to in order to escape this farce? Yeah, I thought not. Okay, you have a good day now. Uh-huh. Yeah, I love you too. Who the hell was that? Well, I guess I've got another game I need to talk about. For now, though, it's back to Sin. Despite its aged graphics and a focus on levels in sewers, industrial areas, and laboratories, Sin manages to avoid the trap of endless browns and greens by opting for a much wider color palette than many of its contemporaries. Combine that with, overall, great level design, and you've got a game with plenty of sections I remember vividly even before replaying it. Some levels also include secondary objectives, though much like a lot of the interactive parts of the environment, they don't seem to serve much of a gameplay purpose. They seem to mostly be there as an extra challenge to the player, which is fine by me. Call me weird, but I prefer the game itself acknowledging my feats than an achievement notification that rips me out of my immersion. I do enjoy most of the levels a lot. They're big without being pointlessly massive, and exploring off the beaten path is often rewarded with more ammo and health which is great since you'll be burning through both of them once the cyborg starts showing up. Sin is kind enough to let you pick up armor off of defeated enemies, too. Even more reason to aim for unprotected skulls and avoid blowing everything to bits. I wish more shooters with armor counters did this. I've played far too many FPS games where armor placement is so few and far between that I spend most of the game without any extra protection. Looking at you, Kingpin! Frassin' frassin' 100% accurate enemies who are next to impossible to put in a pain state. There are also moments scattered across the game that can affect later levels. The easiest one to note is right at the beginning. If you shoot these explosives on the rooftop, the ceiling will collapse there, and when you're running around the bank in the next level, you'll spot that chunk of debris scattered across the room with a giant hole where the roof used to be. It's a small touch, but these moments help the player feel like they have an impact on the game world. Thus far, I've talked about what I like about Sin, but what are its faults? Even patches can't iron out every issue. Well, there's a few big ones that may turn off some players. First of all, Sin's levels are filled with areas that, while not quite pitch black, are just dark enough for the enemies dressed in all black to blend in with the environment. Can you see the diver about to turn me into a John Blade kebab? I sure didn't! This wouldn't be so much of a problem if the only thing the game gave you to light the way wasn't friggin' glow sticks that are also in extremely short supply. Several of the cheapest deaths that weren't from the super snipers was because of moments like this. Second, the explosive weapons kind of suck. The missile launcher is probably the most useful out of all of them, but even then, it lacks a sense of power you would expect from a weapon that looks like this. The spider mines have their uses too, but they max out at 10, and you need to point them directly at an enemy. In the time it takes to do that and for them to reach the enemy, you could just blast them in the face with your MG. The grenade launcher is the worst, though. Enemies never had any trouble hitting me with this thing, but I'll be damned if I ever manage to angle my shots correctly with it. Not to mention the annoyance of having to switch between it and the HMG firing mode. The main campaign already rarely drops ammo for the HMG, so why not make it just a grenade launcher? The other kinetic weapons provide me with plenty of firepower as it is. I don't need another one. And that's a sentence I never thought I'd say. Third, and probably the most obvious point, Sin's pubescent horniness is going to be a divisive aspect. Personally, I find it quaint and kind of charming. Like an immature kid desperately trying to be seen as a mature adult. The fact that I'm amused by how I used to think that this looked appealing in any way probably plays a factor into that. Nice boobies! However, there are bound to be those who find this to be insulting objectification with zero substance. That's a perfectly valid opinion, by the way. People are allowed to dislike things I enjoy. That should go without saying, but you know, the internet. What do you mean you don't agree with me? Do you know who you're dealing with? Frankly, even I think it becomes too stupid and sleazy when, spoilers, 
Alexis escapes by making Blade hesitate to shoot her because he thinks she's going to flash him. That's right. Our badass hero with nerves of steel, who faced down a kaiju-sized mutant armed to the teeth, is undone by the power of boners. Dude, hot woman or not, she's trying to kill billions. This is not the time to be thinking with your dick. That ending seriously takes the wind out of what was up to that point a well-done, exciting climax. Good night, everybody. If Blade has to get blue balled, then so do you. Outside of those three problems, I didn't run into any other egregious issues while playing Sin. I guess the stealth missions aren't all that great, but you aren't forced to sneak around and all getting caught does is fail an optional objective. Any other gripes I may have had are more nitpicky like that, so let's move on to the expansion pack, Wages of Sin. I seriously love that title. I kinda wish that the compilation re-release was called something similar, instead of Sin Gold. Have fun with your game titles, people! Not everything needs to have a gold, definitive, or Game of the Year edition. I draw the line at Gothic 3 getting a Game of the Year edition. Where was I? Alright, oh, Wages of Sin. Stupid ADD making me go on tangents. Set after the main game, our villain this time around is mob boss Gianni Monero. He plans to use Alexis's research for his own takeover, and once again, only Blade can stop him. As soon as he gets done with his car chase. As hilarious as it looks now, I find it really impressive that they managed to have so much going on in an in-engine cutscene. Considering most games of that time preferred to render cutscenes in-game only for static dialogue shots, it's an ambitious decision to buck that trend for, of all things, an expansion pack. One I think paid off. Before I talk about Wages of Sin, though, I should mention that I've read that this expansion was pretty bugged back in the day, and that the stealth levels were next to impossible. So I'm not sure what to credit to the original developers, and what to credit to Night Dive. As it stands, I ran into very few bugs in either Sin or Wages of Sin, so the version playable these days has been polished to a T. So an extra shout out to those fine folks for fixing this in the base game for modern computers. Wages of Sin was made by a separate studio, as was the style at the time. Rather than Ritual, we have 2015 Inc. to thank for this one. The name may not be familiar to everyone, but anyone who's played military shooters in the early 2000s knows of their opus. Medal of Honor, Allied Assault. Oh, and several members of the team who worked on both that and Wages of Sin went on to form some company called Infinity Ward. Don't know if that's all that relevant, though. So yeah, some of the developers responsible for Call of Duty got their start on an expansion pack for Sin. I'm still recovering from the whiplash I suffered upon learning that. Even with a future pedigree like that, Wages of Sin is still just an expansion pack, right? Just more of Sin, but shorter and more difficult. Maybe a few new weapons if you're lucky. That's what 99% of FPS expansion packs were, after all. Okay, Blade. Here's what I've got. Monero's security is very tight here. From what I can tell, he's placed guard posts behind the main casino walls. Now, if at all possible, try to find a way into the security area other than a firefight. There are way too many civilians in here for that. Well, I'm happy to say that Wages of Sin lands in that 1%. I would go so far as to say it expands on the original in a few ways. Imagine that! What jumped out the most to me was the level design. For all the praise I have for Sin's levels, they are still pretty linear. Wages of Sin, meanwhile, just strides up confidently and smacks you in the face with its open levels that offer multiple paths to the same objective. I kept thinking of games like Deus Ex or Thief while I was playing this. While it isn't quite to that level of complexity, it is surprising to be given options like this at all when it comes to approaching an objective. The most awesome one I actually discovered while I was re-recording footage, because the expansion pack runs in a different EXE and I forgot to set the proper resolution. Somehow, I failed to notice this until well after I'd beaten Wages of Sin. It was well worth it though to discover this touch. Early on, while blasting your way through one of Gianni Matragrano's drug labs, you can find this scientist who tells you that Monero has kidnapped his daughter. This sends you to meet up with Blade's mob contact, One Thumb, and his disturbing plumber's crack. If I had to see it, then so do you. One Thumb tells you that they're conveniently holding her in the apartment complex next door. The first time I played this, I didn't find the scientist and wound up going to a completely different level. I didn't save Jessica, no relation to Jessica from the OVA or Jessica from Sin episodes, until much later. When I found this, I figured it was just a neat way to mix up possible level orders. Nope. Notice the time of day here before I go into the apartment? In my first playthrough, this happened in the dead of night, 
Of course, I just figured it was a neat little detail of little consequence. My suspicion remained low through the apartment level since it's basically the same the whole way through in both versions until the end. In the nighttime one, Jessica is right there waiting to be saved. In this one, however, she's been taken to the Crane shipyards before Blade arrived. No worries. That level and the warehouse section before it was a piece of cake my first time through and... Wait, what was that JC said about snipers? Blade! Blade, come in, Blade! It talked to me! Okay... Wasn't expecting that? The differences between this version and the one I played the first time around are night and day. Literally! In the daytime version, you only have to deal with armed teamsters. Here, those easily dispatched goons are replaced with Syntec troops with considerably more armor. Not to mention the fuck-mothering snipers! At least these ones occasionally miss. The shipyards themselves are different as well. In the daytime version, you're mistaken for a new employee and nobody really hassles you unless you go into a restricted area. It makes it really easy to take out the guards near the alarms. The nighttime version, however, is significantly harder. Cameras everywhere and the guards attack you on sight. I gave up on trying to be sneaky in this one and just started blasting. Fundamentally, these are the same levels as before with the same objectives and item placements. However, the change in enemies will force you to adapt your tactics. The fact that 2015 put the effort into having alternate versions of any levels for an expansion pack is nothing less than astounding. It makes me happy to know that the two men responsible for the level design and wages of Sin, Benson Russell and Zeed Reek, would go on to bigger and better games not long after. Both men would work as level designers on Allied Assault before heading their separate ways. Russell would continue working on the Medal of Honor series all the way up to Airborne before moving on to Naughty Dog to work on series like Uncharted, while Reek would move on to Infinity Ward to work on Call of Duty, even being the senior design lead for Call of Duty 2, the best World War II FPS of all time, fucking fight me on that. Enough praise for the level designers already. I need to move on to the new weapons and... Oh. Oh. <laughs> I can dual wield pistols now. If only I had bullet time, then this would be perfect. These bad boys eclipse even the machine gun at times. All the same accuracy of the single pistol with twice the firing rate. They are OP as all hell and I do not care. There's also the plasma bow, a crossbow-like weapon you need to charge up. That seems to defeat the point of making it a crossbow. I failed to realize the full power of this bad boy until pretty late into my playthrough. Hit an enemy with it and they're probably going down in one or two shots. Hit the ground near them and it explodes a second later, taking them down only a little bit slower. Then we have this backpack which somehow fires four missiles at a time while only using up two rockets per shot. Totally worth it for the extra damage radius. They apparently added guided missiles for the normal launcher, but I didn't find that out until after I'd beaten the game. Whoops. They also added a nuke launcher, which does what it sounds like it does. Now we come to what is probably the biggest disappointment among the new weapons, the flamethrower. Yeah, this thing sucks. I mean, it does work, just not in any satisfying way. Enemies don't even react to it like you'd expect, they just fall over like if you'd shot them. Burn, God damn you! Finally, there's this piece of crap. I don't even know if it does more than chip damage to enemies. It knocks them back, but there aren't exactly a lot of opportunities for you to push them into death pits or anything. I guess I could have tried in the penthouse level, but I was too busy trying not to die. Speaking of that, kudos for the unique death cutscene if you walk out a broken window in this level. Oh! Yeah! Nice! The biggest game changer, however, comes in the form of a flashlight. You never know how much you miss something until you need it and don't have it. My issue with the dark areas in Sin disappears immediately. Wait a minute. I can play the original campaign inside Wages of Sin. I wonder... Nope, couldn't find a flashlight. I did learn that I could have been dual wielding my whole time through the base game, though. Also found an extra level that I forgot about when capturing footage before. I knew I remembered a missile silo level that I hated more than life itself. For all the praise I've heaped on this expansion, the final boss of Wages can kiss my ass. Three phases, supplies hidden behind doors I didn't realize I could open at first because you just dropped into this level and I was busy dodging rocket fire, and worst of all, he gets his own nuke launcher. Are you kidding me? 
I'm already ducking and weaving missiles left and right, and now you're gonna give him that too? You know what you need? A good skull fucking. I can't help but wonder the kind of influence Sin may have had on the genre had it not been rushed out the door to compete with Half-Life. Both the base game as well as Wages of Sin present a solid base of classic FPS concepts combined with ambitious set pieces and fantastic level design that it feels to me like a damn shame for it to be condemned into the dustbin of forgotten late 90s shooters. Seriously, more people talk about Daikatana than Sin. Things like that are exactly why I avoid discussing games I dislike on this channel. Far too many gaming videos are dedicated to hating on the bad or broken games instead of searching for the worthwhile ones that people should be playing instead. Hopefully Sin will get his time in the sun with Night Dive's upcoming remaster, Sin Reloaded. However Sin Reloaded winds up playing whenever it finally comes out, Sin Gold will still be a fantastic way to experience the original game without all the bugs that plagued the initial release. And at only 10 bucks on Steam or GOG, it's a great bang for your buck. Well, that's it for today's game. See you next time.